In the 18th century, the British Empire and other European empires began to focus on conquering and developing trade in the Far East. During this period, many important figures in Europe, from rulers to philosophers, admired the products brought from Eastern countries such as India and China and praised the wealth of these countries. Over time, European empires started to implement policies of conquering these Eastern countries and caused various turmoil environments. India was the first of the great empires to fall into the hands of Europeans. This did not happen as a direct result of military conquest. Even after the collapse of the Mughal Empire, there was a continuing economic development with the growing wealth of merchants, bankers, and magnates. But they lived in the shadow of six warring kingdoms that gave them no say in the policies they pursued or even any real security in their property. It was these developments that opened the door for the British East India Company with its troops and arms. In the early 18th century, the company was still a marginal force in the subcontinent. It relied on concessions from Indian rulers for trading posts on the coast. But over time, they forged increasingly strong ties with Indian merchants from the interior who sold them cloth and other goods. Then, in the 1750s, an official of the company, Robert Clive, backed one candidate for power in Bengal against another, defeated a French contingent, and took control of the province, the richest part of the former Mughal Empire. While an Indian Nivab appeared to have the rights and privileges of a king, the company collected taxes and ran the affairs of government. At the same time as Britain was losing its old empire in North America, it was beginning to build a new empire in India. The company aimed to raise all its expenses from the taxes of the Indian population and relied on an army of mostly sepoy Indian troops. Success in Bengal was followed by success elsewhere. Other Indian rulers also found the company a useful ally and used it to train their troops and organize their administration. The Indian merchant welcomed the company's growing influence as it bought increasing quantities of cloth from them and Indian rulers saw it as a guarantee against its interference with their fortunes. The company consolidated its power by creating a new class of large landowners from sections of the old zamindars. By 1850, Britain had extended its rule throughout the subcontinent, defeating some rulers and buying others. The Marathas were conquered in 1818, Sindh in 1843, the Sikhs in 1849, and Oud in 1856. British ministers boasted that the company's approach was in line with the Roman principle of divide et impera, divide and rule. Using bribery in some cases and violence in others, they found allies wherever they went, playing one ruler against another, one kingdom against another kingdom, one privileged class against another privileged class, one caste against another caste, one religion against another religion. Enormous fortunes flowed to the company's agents. Clive left India with $234,000 in plunder, and Governor General W. Aaron Hastings was notorious for taking huge bribes. This wealth was created by the mass of peasants. The planters of Bengal and Bihar paid $2 million a year in taxes. The company called its officials collectors and used the same extortion methods as the Mongols, but with far more effective and devastating consequences. This guaranteed that the poverty that had afflicted the masses of the population at the end of the Mongol period would now be even worse. The crop failure of 1769 was followed by famines and epidemics that claimed 10 million lives. A region that only half a century earlier had stunned Europeans with its wealth was now on its way to becoming one of the poorest in the world. No matter how much the Indian merchant benefited from his trade relations, the company was controlled by Britain. This was dramatically evident in the first decades of the 19th century. The mechanization of Lancashire cotton mills suddenly made them able to produce cloth more cheaply than India's handicraft industry. Instead of Indian products playing a central role in Britain's markets, British cloth flooded Indian markets and destroyed much of the Indian textile industry, ruining the lives of millions of textile workers and damaging the profits of Indian merchants.
As the country's industry collapsed and the British capitalists drove them out of profitable fields such as shipbuilding and banking, they had no means of protecting their interests as they had no government of their own. In the meantime, the small number of highly privileged British officials had become more tyrannical, more patronizing, more greedy. They began to reap the consequences of their behavior in 1857. When officers disrespected the religious beliefs of the company's sepoy Indian soldiers by ordering them to lubricate their cartridges with beef fat, which was forbidden for Hindus, and lard, which was forbidden for Muslims, the soldiers revolted against the officers. The behavior of the white owners created a focus of anger throughout India. Within weeks, the rebels took control of large areas of northern India, killing British officers and officials they captured and besieging others in a few isolated fortified positions. Hindus and Sikhs forgot their hostility to Muslims and installed a Mongol heir as emperor in the historic capital Delhi. The uprising was eventually crushed. The panicked government rushed British troops to the subcontinent and officers managed to convince the troops in Madras and Bombay to put down the rebellion in the north. The most brutal measures were taken to eliminate any threat of future rebellion. However, the government realized that repression alone could not pacify India. If the goose that laid the golden eggs was not to be killed, the greed of British trade had to be brought under some control, and more emphasis had to be placed on divide and rule by institutionalizing communal and religious divisions, even if this meant abandoning attempts to reconcile Indian customs with bourgeois norms. The administration of the East India Company was replaced by direct British rule. Queen Victoria was proclaimed Queen of India, and every effort was made to bind local Indian rulers and landowners to the imperial system. The British owners despised the people they called natives, but they still relied on them to control large swathes of the population. The old Rajas, or Maharajas, lived in much more luxuriously reconstructed palaces with their numerous wives, servants, horses, elephants, and hunting dogs, sometimes even seeming to rule their country, most famously Hyderabad, but in practice taking their orders from British advisors. The Zemindars, dotted in the countryside of the north, lived in their own, more limited luxuries, and ruled the peasantry relying on the British, even if they occasionally grumbled about their status. Next came the village Brahmans and headmen, who helped the Britons collect their taxes, and the Zamindars, who collected their rents. All of them used their old caste or religious distinctions to give themselves an advantage in bargaining with those at the top to help exploit those at the bottom. By the end of the 19th century, caste relations were much more systematized than at the beginning of the century. At the same time, a new middle class was emerging whose members had hopes of advancing through the structure of the British polity as lawyers, clerks, or civil servants, but found their hopes continually thwarted by racial considerations. <laughs>